I look back over my life and I think about, um, I think about why do I have friends who have, who seem to have uh, at times these long periods where they have fallen away from God, where they've gotten on the broad path. Does anybody know that Christian I'm talking about? They got saved, they got baptized, they were in church. It was all this big deal and big, um, I'm like, it was the most important thing to them. And then, and then it wasn't. And then they've been gone like a decade. Anybody know that guy? That gal? I know that guy or gal. And I, I look at my life and I go, why am I different? And it's definitely not because I'm stronger, I'm more dedicated, I'm more, it's not got anything to do with me. And, and I'm thinking, why, am, why have, do I not have seasons or months or years um, where, where I have been on the broad path? Now, don't get me wrong. I sin, don't want to, and I do sin, and, and I'm far from perfect. But I'm talking about like, a lot, long time of just being on the broad path. I have a friend that, um, man, he was witnessing to me when I was lost, and he was always preaching, 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 sharing the Bible. Look what the Bible says. Da, da, da. Jesus Bible, Jesus Bible in his church, and you got to come, and you got to come, and you got to come. And that went on for a couple years, and then I got saved, and, and then like a year after that, um, he just stopped talking about God. He talk, stopped talking about church. He start, stopped talking about the Bible. Um, I spoke with him probably six months ago, and, and it was obvious by just the language he was speaking that he wasn't on the narrow path. And, and I think, why? Why is that? Why is he on the broad path? And I'm not talking for a little bit. I mean, it's been 10, 15 years he's been on this broad path. And it's like, why did that not happen to me? How has that not happened to me in my life? And and I, I think back to the time when I was saved, I'm thankful for a church that really shared the mission. Hey, Robbie, this is what we're to be about. And I do believe that when you understand the mission and then you're willing to surrender to that mission, that it keeps you on the narrow path. A person without a purpose will float around and do anything, right? Um, but when you understand the mission, and I think about in the military, every soldier needs to understand the mission. And how do they understand the mission? Um, the, the leader gives it to many leaders who then give that mission down to others. And Jesus did the very same thing. Um, right before he ascended into heaven, Jesus said, gave us the mission. And he gave the mission to his 12 and his 120. And, and they gave it to more and more. And then finally they gave it to me. And now I'm here giving it to you. This is the mission of God. And when you live out the mission of God, I promise you, not only will you be rewarded, it will keep you so close to Jesus. So are you at Romans 1.16 yet? Romans 1.16, amen when you're there. Amen. amen, like you got somebody online and they're going to listen to you and they're going to hear you. I got the mic on, so let's amen like we're awake, that we're thankful, that we're in the word, ready to receive. Amen? amen. Perfect. You guys are awesome. For I am not what? Ashamed. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is what? The power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and then to the Greek. I, I listened to this verse, and this was a verse that was shared with me when I was first saved, and I, the Apostle Paul was saying, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Why is that? Because it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. You're like, well, why would the Apostle Paul be ashamed? Uh, maybe because Christianity wasn't accepted, because the gospel was rejected by so many. Why, why would the Apostle Paul be ashamed? Well, they murdered their leader, Jesus, and nailed him to a cross. They arrested people for sharing the gospel. None of his culture accepted the gospel. He was never going to be accepted in the world in which he lived. People were going to disassociate with him because he was saved. There's a lot of reasons to be ashamed. And I think about our culture today. I think that where Christianity gets in trouble is we try to fit too much into the world. We don't stand out. And the only way you're going to be accepted by the world is to be like them. And if I'm like them, I'm going to have to be ashamed of the gospel. I'm going to have to hide it. I'm going to have to cover it. I'm going to have to keep that a secret. 
The Apostle Paul says, I'm not keeping it a secret. I am not ashamed of the gospel. You're like, well, what's the gospel? The gospel is the truth that your sin separated you from God. The gospel is that God became a man, Jesus. He lived a sinless life. He died on a cross to pay for our sins, to reconcile us with God through faith alone, that they placed him in a tomb that he rose from the dead. The gospel. And he said, I'm not ashamed of that gospel message. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. And I, I think about that, that truth. And I think about how, how the gospel can change our lives. Josh, would you do me a favor? Would you close that side door back there by the kid's wing? We've got a really happy camper back there this morning. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and then to the Greek. The power is in the gospel, that message that I just shared with you. That's where the power comes from. The power is in the gospel. It's not in a person. It's not in a person. I, I think about the gospel itself carries the power unto salvation. You know, I talk to people and they say, I, I saw a guy yesterday and hadn't seen him in, I don't know, eight or 10 years. And we got to talking about faith. He said, yeah, you saved me. Oh, I did not. <laughs> I didn't save anybody. I don't have the power to save. I need to be rescued, right? And I was rescued. I, I, don't, I don't have the power to save. Jesus saved you. The gospel saved you. The power is in the gospel, not a person. And I think the big C church gets this messed up a lot. I think the church across America gets this messed up a lot, right? Um, your church becomes known by the preacher, right? Well, that's Andy Stanley's church. That's Craig Rochelle's church. That's Stephen Furtick's church. That's, no, it's Jesus Christ's church. Those guys, phenomenal in all they do, yes. But the power isn't in them, it's in the, in the gospel message itself. And, you know, in churches, it always cracks me up when churches try to hire a new lead pastor or they're hiring someone, they want to, you submit a resume and they want to give you like, here's my pedigree, here's the Bible college I went to, here's the seminary I went to, here's my master's and, and my doctorate and here's all of this. And, and churches are notorious when they, when you ask them what, who are you looking for to be your lead pastor? They'll say, oh, I, I want somebody who's like 25 years old and have their, has their master's and their MDiv and, and, and all this education. And I'm not anti-education. Don't hear me that. Don't hear me say that at all. But when I look at the, the disciples and I look at, I look at some of the most instrumental people that God has ever used, he says, even in his own word, I choose the weak things and the foolish things that confound the minds of the wise. Why is it that we don't look for people who are filled with the Spirit who just believe God can do anything to be our pastors? Well, probably because we think the power is in them, their ability to lead us, their ability to preach, their ability to tweet, their ability to post, their ability to do this, that, and that. When the power is in the gospel itself, it's not in a person. I was, um, I met a guy, uh, I met a guy last week. He'll be preaching for me on June 9th and 16th when I'm on vacation. And, and I was asking him, he was telling me about his church, and I was asking him, I said, um, how come I've never heard of this church? Because it's a fairly large church, 26,000 people, right? And... And he doesn't work there anymore. And he said, well, it's simple. It's because our lead pastor's never written a book. I said, do what? He goes, why do you know Andy Stanley? Why do you know Craig Rochelle? Why do you know, you know, all these guys? Because they, they've written books. That's how you know them. They get to a certain thing. They write a book. And there's nothing wrong with writing a book. And it's have books that help people. There's nothing wrong with that. But the reality is, like, that's how you know them. Because they have a big social media platform or they've got this education behind them or we just didn't really care much about that stuff. We just care about people getting people saved and baptized, he said. I, I think about this truth that the power is in the gospel, not the person. And I feel like that's really good news for somebody like me. That's really good news for somebody like you. Because all of us have a little Moses in us. You know what I'm talking about? We all have a little Moses in us. Lord, I know you got this thing you want me to do, but, but I, and we would start making excuses. And Moses' excuse was, I'm not a good speaker. I'm not a good communicator. 
And, and when I started realizing that the power of the gospel, the power is in the gospel, it's not in Robbie, it's not in my communication ability. It's not that, you know, it, it's not that that brings along salvations and, and baptisms. And what you see today is not because of Robbie Smith. What you see today is because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It brings life. It brings hope. It brings healing. The power is in the gospel, not the person. So, so what that should do for you, anybody in a maroon seat today, is that should say, wait a minute. If the power is in the gospel, not the person, then God can utilize me. God can use me. God can do amazing things through even me. Are you following me, church? Are you with me? Like, it's a good thing to know that I don't limit God, that my limitations aren't God's limitations, that he overcomes my limitations because he's not limited at all, right? I want you to look in Acts in the, the 17th chapter. Would you read this text with me? I think this text paints a pretty good picture that we need God. He doesn't need us, right? That everyone in the world is replaceable. All of these big time pastors and leaders, they're all replaceable. That the power is in the gospel, not the person, okay? Let's read this text, and I think you'll get that. <clears throat> Acts 17, verse 24, describing our God, the God who made the world and everything in it. He is Lord over the heavens and the earth, and he doesn't live in shrines made by hands. Neither is he what? Served by who? <clears throat> He's not served by human beings. As though he what? As though he needed anything. Now, goes on to say, since he gives everyone life and breath and all things. You know, this ought to be an eye-opening passage, passage for you if you think, hey, you know what, I'm something God could utilize me. I've got some pretty good skills. Anytime, anybody who's arrogant, this passage ought to humble you. And anyone who is afraid to do anything for God because they think they limit God, they should read, look at this passage and go, oh, wait a minute, this passage really is freeing for me. This passage says that God can do anything. I want you to, I'm gonna read the passage with you one more time. The God who made the heavens, who made the world and everything in it, he is Lord over heaven and earth. He doesn't live in shrines made by hands. Neither is he served by human hands as though he needed anything. You don't serve a needy God. If you won't follow God, if you won't serve God, if God's laying something, hey, if God is telling you to do something tomorrow morning and you don't do it, I've heard people say, well, then it just won't happen. Ah. He'll just use her instead of you. He'll bring somebody else along. You'll miss out on the blessing. God's will is going to be accomplished regardless of your obedience, right? And, and you're not so, like God's not sitting there biting his nails. Oh, if Jesse will just follow me, I'll do this. No, God's more like this. I got something amazing that I'm going to do, Jesse, and you get to be a part of that. And if you choose to understand that your limitations aren't my limitations, we can do amazing things together. But if not, I'll use Casey behind you. I'll use Casey, nope. I'll use Steve, nope. I'll use, I'll use Dave. I'll use anyone. God's not served by human hands. He's not a needy God. Does this sound like a needy God? He made the world and everything in it. He gives life to everything, right? He doesn't live in a little shrine, it says. And it goes on to say, look what I've already done is a, a point in case. Now, if you're, you're following along in the sermon outline, it's not there. I apologize. I, it just kind of spoke to me this morning. It goes on to say, from one man, he made every nation to live on over the whole earth and has determined their appointed times and boundaries and where they live. Does that sound like a needy God? It doesn't sound like a needy God. It sounds like a God who can do anything and everything he pleases because he can. I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God unto salvation to all who believe. That's good news for you because you don't limit God. You don't have to be afraid to do something for God because he's not depending on your skill set. What you need to become is someone who depends upon him. Put yourself in situations where only he can do something through you. I, <clears throat> I, uh, I think about great preachers who have lived in my lifetime. I think about great evangelists and they, like Billy Graham. Billy Graham, man, would it be fair to say, anybody know Billy Graham? Would it be fair to, fair to say that he's led 100 people to Christ? That'd be an understatement, wouldn't it? 
how about 100,000 people or a couple hundred thousand people probably to Christ over his lifetime? And you're like, well, I could never be him. Or you start my thinking, man, look at him and look at his ability. I could never speak like him. I would never have his boldness. I would never have his, 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 his. But I just shared with you that the power is not in him. It's in the gospel. And what did Billy Graham do? He shared the gospel. He just shared the gospel. You're like, but he's led tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people to Christ. And there was a time when even Billy Graham hadn't led his first person to Jesus. But he led that one, and he led another, and he led another, and he led another. And that ought to be everyone's story. I led this person, and then I led that person, and then I led this person. I met a guy the other day at this conference the guy was telling you about. His church is called Sagebrush Church, and he doesn't, he's not employed there anymore. He was never the lead pastor. He was the executive pastor, and this church grew to 26. He said it's probably 27, 28,000 people now, and, um, and they have like 10 different campuses everywhere. We were talking about, um, I was talking about, man, that's phenomenal growth. How, how did God do that? Can you explain the story? So he started telling me the story, and then we got to talking uh, about other things, and another guy from our denomination walks up and said, oh, you met Robbie Smith? God's doing big things down there. And, and, uh, and then he said, they're baptizing people left and right. And I said, well, I said, you know, <laughs> he's just telling me about his church. And I said, at 26, 27,000 people, I'm sure that they see a lot of baptisms. And I looked at him and said, how many of you baptized? He said, uh, last year, I baptized 1,700 myself. What? Oh, yeah, I, it's not, I didn't baptize everybody in our church, but I just, I baptized 1,700 myself. Wow. You see what happens when you realize that the power is not in a person, it's in the gospel, and you just share the gospel? 1,700 people in a year. But the challenge like, why, why isn't that your story? Why isn't that my story? Because the challenge is there and it's real to not be ashamed. To not be ashamed of the gospel. To not be ashamed. What, why would I be ashamed again? Because you're trying to fit into the world. And the world hates Jesus. And it's only when I try to fit into the world that I'm ashamed to tell people that I follow Jesus or tell others about Jesus or live my faith out in front of them. There was a, a time when I worked at Pin Aluminum. Pin Aluminum was a factory over in Murfreesboro and we made aluminum and I was a new believer, man. I was saved and I think a week later they gave me a Bible. And I remember the day when I decided, well, I'm going to work on Monday and I'm taking my Bible, right? And I got my Bible in my hand. I get out in the parking lot, and there's a guard shack, and, and, and uh, I'm getting towards the, the guard shack, and I realize I got this Bible, and it's amazing. This thing looks like a suitcase, right? I mean, it really doesn't, but it feels like a suitcase. What it really feels like is every eye is on me. So I pull up in the parking lot. I get out. I grab my Bible. I'm walking in, and before I get to the guard shack, I turn around and go back to the vehicle. And I caught myself laying the Bible on the front seat. I couldn't leave the Bible in the vehicle because I knew God wanted me to be in the Bible. But I also knew if I took the Bible in, people were going to know. And let me tell you, the Bible was the last thing you would have thought would have been in my hand. If I leave an unsaved heathen on Friday and I come back Monday morning with a Bible in my hand, so I couldn't leave it in there, so I grab it and I start walking. I just set it in my dinner bucket and I put my lid down and I walk in with my dinner bucket and I work a couple hours and break time comes and I'm sitting down in the break room and I open up my lid of my bread and there's, oh, there's the Bible and I'm in a small break room, maybe 50 people in the break room, something like that, 50 to 100. And for some reason, I felt like every eye was on me. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? I felt like every eye was on me. No, they weren't. They were busy telling their stories and doing their thing. I opened it up and I set it out and I thought I was going to read it. I couldn't read it. I was so nervous. Couldn't read it. I get it. You got to grow in boldness. You got to ask God for boldness like the New Testament believers did. But I opened that Bible and I was like, God, I'm not going to be ashamed. You weren't ashamed of me. I'm not ashamed of you. And do you know 30 days later, I led somebody to the Lord and do you know that within a few months, I was calling my wife saying, hey, I'll be home late. 
I'm in the parking lot talking to somebody about Jesus. And this conversation went 30, 40 minutes on. Like, when you're not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, God can and will do amazing things through you. But the challenge, again, is not to be ashamed. So who are you telling? Who are you sharing your faith with? Who are you, who are you inviting to church? Who are you telling your personal story to? If you're not ashamed, who are you doing it to, right? That's the challenge. And I got to be honest, you will never fulfill the mission if you're ashamed. I, uh, I want to read another passage, which is the actual mission. It's found in Matthew in the 28th chapter. Matthew 28. Would you read this text with me? Matthew 28. It says, go therefore and make what? Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. What? Teaching them to observe everything that I've commanded you. And remember, I am with you always, even to the end. Now, these are Jesus' words, the last words he says before he ascends up into heaven. So you know the story. Jesus is crucified. He's killed. He's laid in a tomb. Three days later, he rose from the dead. He spends the next 40 days appearing to disciples and people. You know, he appears to a couple and then to the 12 and then to 500 people at one time. Spends 40 days teaching and, and chilling out with the new church. And, and then he walks outside one day and they follow him out. And he literally ascends up into heaven. And before he does, he gives us the mission. He says, go therefore and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach them to observe everything I've commanded you and remember I'm with you always, even to the end of this age. <laughs> I'll tell you the full story in a little bit, but I was baptizing a guy yesterday and this lady in a long skirt came up to me as I was baptizing him. Right before I baptized him, we had a portable baptistry in a guy's barn and, and she, she whispers, she says, when you baptize him, will you do it in Jesus' name? Nope. 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 What's the mission? Make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teach them all the things that I've commanded you. I want you to understand the mission is very clear and very simple. Make disciples, baptize them, and teach them. I'm, I'm glad it's simple. Make disciples. How do I make a disciple? I share my faith. I share my faith. I share the gospel because the gospel is the power and the salvation to everyone who believes. I share the gospel when I'm, at, when I'm at home. I share the gospel when I'm at work. I share the gospel if you're in school, the grocery store, the gymnasium, the, the gym. You share the gospel. I want you to understand the mission is very simple, and that is to share the gospel, make disciples. Make disciples. So I want you to envision this. I want you to envision this is southern Illinois. can happen on any day of the week. You live out in the country, and your neighbor's house is on fire. Now, there's no one around for miles, and you hear sirens, and you hear these sirens down the road, and they're a couple miles off. You can faintly hear the siren. You know the firemen are coming. But it, this house has got smoke coming out of every window and every door. And all of a sudden, a mother comes out, your neighbor who you know, and you know she has five kids in the house. And all of them are small children. And she comes out hacking and gagging and coughing. What's the mission, church? What's the mission? Clear and simplest way. What's the mission? Get them out of the fire. Get them out of the house. That's the mission. Well, you know, when I was a volunteer fireman, they taught us that if you go up on the roof and you cut a square on the roof, you can let all the heat out and you can go in the building. But I didn't have a K-tool. You didn't have a K-tool. You didn't have a ladder. And you didn't have time for that nonsense. What's the mission? Get them out of the house. Get those babies to safety. That's the mission. Do you wait Five, ten minutes for the fire trucks to arrive? Then why are you waiting on the preacher to do it for you? Why are you waiting on the Christian to do it for you? Why are you waiting for the deacon to do it for you? Why are you waiting for the small group leader for you? You know the gospel. The gospel, you're not limited. You don't limit the gospel. The gospel is the power of God and salvation. What's stopping you? 
Why wouldn't you go in? Because we're plucking people from the fire. I'm telling you, if you've been saved of your sin, you know, you got to understand that you've been plucked from the fire, right? Your eternal destiny was, depart from me, you work of inequity. I don't know you. You are going to burn in hell forever. And that is the world in which we live. And the gospel message is the way we rescue them. And we got to not be ashamed. So what's the challenge? to the command, the mission, make disciples baptize them, and then teach them. That's the mission. He didn't make this hard. He didn't make this hard at all. How do I teach him? There are so many ways, so many ways. A mother and a father teach their child to talk by how? You buy the certain program, do you do that? You know what I'm talking about? What's that one program you use when you learn a language? You didn't do it. Your kids still know how to talk. How did you do it? How they, you didn't download a program. You just lived out, you spoke English in front of them every day of their life. You lived it out by example. They learned to walk from watching you. They learned to talk from watching you. I'm telling you, you make disciples by being in someone's life and walking beside them. Another way you could do it is just open the book and teach. Just open the book and teach. In the last service, I mentioned that Ruth Teal, who sits on that side of the room in the very back, leads a Bible study in that room in the morning. At the end of last service, um, they were up there doing worship, and I found myself over there talking to someone. I noticed somebody sitting on the very back row. I hadn't seen them before. I walked up and said, hey, how can I pray for you? She smiled, and I realized she's been saved, but she's rather new here. And she said, you know, I feel like I need to get baptized, but I don't want to just get baptized. I know so many people got wet behind the ears, my words, not hers. They got, they got baptized, and then they just kind of fell off, and I don't want to be that person. I said, good for you. Would you like me to introduce you to Ruth? She said, yeah, because one of the ways you make disciples is you just open the book, and you start teaching you just open the book and start teaching. And you're like, but I don't know enough. I haven't been saved long enough. I didn't, I wasn't raised in church. See, you're using all the same exact examples I used with my pastor when a different pastor, six months after I was saved, asked me to come preach in his church. You heard me right. I walked into a church. They had a singing and a homecoming at this church, a little country church. I walked in during the worship time. I stood up and gave my testimony. By the end of the next day, I'd received a phone call from their secretary saying, hey, um, our pastor is going on vacation for two weeks. He wants to know if you'll preach for him one of those weeks. I said, I got a problem. I'm not a preacher. And then I went on a rant with my pastor over the phone saying, what kind of pastor would invite me to come preach in their church? I've been saved six months. I've not read the Bible from the front to the back. I don't know enough. He doesn't know me. I literally said this. What kind of idiot would ask me to come preach? And my pastor was really quiet on the line the whole time I'm ranting. And then he said, well, maybe it's the kind of idiot, Robbie, that just listens to God. And I said, what? What are you talking about? He said, Robbie, I don't know if you don't, know this or not, but you've been saved. You've been reading the Bible. You share your faith. You've led people to Jesus. He said, son, you just need to, just need to go preach. I don't know enough. I haven't been a Christian long enough. I wasn't raised in church. Anybody? And you want to hide behind that excuse when the power is not in you. It's in the gospel. So I asked him, I said, so, so I don't even know what I preach. I mean, what, what should I preach? I don't know enough. I can't. And I'm backpedaling the whole way. And you know what Roger Odom tells me? He says, what, did, what do you know? I said, I know Jesus Christ crucified and rose again. He goes, kind of work for the disciples. Just preach that. What do you say to that? Other than, yes, I'll go do that. I feel like Paul Harvey. And now you know the rest of the story right? Here's the reality is you can just open the book and teach. 
You can share your testimony. This is what I used to be and this is what I'm not anymore. Or you can just start serving in a ministry. I asked Angie, I said, what's the main point for our kids this morning? She said, to be a peacemaker. I said, man, what a great way to disciple kids that in a world full of hate and chaos and the cancel culture that we're teaching them to be peacemakers. So the question I have for you this morning is who are you discipling? Who are you discipling? Who are you living your faith out in front of? Who are you inviting to church? Who are you open the book with? Who are you praying for? Who are you discipling? Where are you serving? What's the mission? Make disciples, baptize them, teach them. Who have you baptized? Who have you baptized? Guy I met baptized 1,700 people. We've seen about 100 people baptized here in this last year. Who have you baptized? This is the mission Jesus gave you. Make disciples, baptize people, and teach them. So who have you baptized? Well, that's the preacher's job, really. That's not what this says. It's not what this says. Who are you teaching? You know, the last thing that the commander in chief, Jesus Christ, said to us is go make disciples. And you know, when, when he comes again, or when we go be with him, do you think he won't ask us, who have you discipled? Who have you baptized? Who have you taught? What have you done with this amazing grace of God that I've given you? You think he won't ask that? Man, we hold our kids account of just cleaning their rooms. We're talking about plucking people from the fire. You all been in a house fire. You know the terror, the tragedy, the destruction it can have. You were on that broad path. So who are you discipling? Who are you baptizing? Who are you teaching? I want to share one more passage with you, and I, I hope you'll read it with me. It's Matthew 5. I want you to personalize this text. I want you to, when, when it says you, I want you to put your name there. I want you to think of your name as you read this. Jesus is doing, uh, you know, his, his, uh, his famous Sermon on the Mount, and man, he's getting it. He's like, man, if the salt of the earth, you're the salt of the earth, and, and if a salt loses its savor, what good's it for? I know it's not there yet. I'm just setting the scene, right? And so, so he's just going to town about all this in preacher mode, and then he says, you are the light of the world. He said a city situated on a hill cannot be what? can't be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket, but rather on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. And I'm like, man, that is great preacher stuff. That sounds just like Jesus, right? Hey, there's this city. It's on a hill, and it can't be hidden. What can't be hidden? Well, the lights from the city, when I'm out in the rural area and I see the city, I see safety, I see life, I see food, I see protection being in the city. Uh, when I walk into a room and that room has a candle on it on a lampstand, it's not, it's not like under a basket. No, you light the candle so that you give light to, like, man, that's great for Jesus. And I like it's a good Jesus talk. But then look what he does in verse 16. He puts it on you and I again. In the same way, let your light, what? Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. You know, when I think about what this text is saying to Robbie Smith and to everyone in a maroon chair this morning, everybody who's watching online, it's saying, let your light shine. Quit being hidden. Don't be ashamed. Let me tell you something about shame. Shame keeps us from shining. You hear me? Shame will keep you from shining. Well, who am I to talk about Jesus? I'll tell you who you are. You're someone who's been forgiven. I don't care what your past was. I don't care what culture says about your past and the stereotype and the box they've placed you in. God brought you out of that. He redeemed you. He saved you. He forgave you. He brought you into his family. Hey, your past is now your platform. It's not something that you should be ashamed of. God saved you through that. He saved you from that. You've been forgiven, so shine. The world might call you whatever, but God calls you a child. So shine. You know, one of the things that got me with this Bible, carrying it into the, the factory, was the fact that Jesus died on a cross publicly for me. That wasn't something done in private. 
He bled. He was in excruciating pain, and everybody witnessed that. The cross, he died. That was like, he died for me. He took my shame upon his cross. Publicly, he was naked, publicly humiliated, and he did that for you. And what does he call us to do? He calls us to shine. Shine for him. So many times we want people to notice us, but for the wrong reasons. Our physical features, our material possessions, our skills and our talents. But do they want, do we want them to notice our Jesus? That's the reality. Christians who are on a mission, they don't hide their faith. They don't cover their faith. They display their faith for all to see. There's six ways I want to give you as we wrap up this sermon today that you cannot be ashamed, that you can shine for Jesus. And the first one starts the most simplest way, and that's share your testimony. There's not another person in the world that has your exact testimony. It's yours. It's unique. No one can argue with it. It's your experience with God. So share your testimony. Second way, read the Bible with someone. If you're following along on the sermon outline, the electronic one, there's a spot where you can click it. It'll take you to our webpage where it shows every Bible plan that we have created and put out there. And when they sign up, and why don't you take somebody with you and say, let's sign up for this together. Let's read the Bible together. It'll send you a text message every morning with the passage you're going to read. And who knows, maybe you get together once or twi twice over FaceTime or a phone call or over a lunch, and you discuss what you read and you learn together. You make disciples together. You know that we're on TikTok, YouTube, Facebook. Where am I leaving out? Um, Instagram. Share our content. Let someone know that you're a believer and you're connected with this church. It's like I see hair products. I see cars. I see all kinds of silly, funny things on your Facebook pages. Has Jesus made it on your social channels? You know, another way that you can, you can share shine before people is pretty simple. You just walk up to them and you just pray for them. Just walk up to them and pray for them. Like, well, I don't know how to pray. I don't know what I'd pray for them. Father, I pray for Mike. God, as he was, he's overcoming this stroke, God. He's doing great things, but you are doing so many things in his life. And I just pray you heal him and give him a good day. It's in Jesus' name I pray. But I didn't know that about him. I don't know anything about her, but her shirt says, perfectly imperfect, right? What's your first name? Emily. Father, I lift up Emily to you, and I just ask that you would bless her. Lord, I don't know her story or what you're doing in her life. We're glad she's here, but Lord, I do pray. I pray that you would bless her today. Let her know that you love her, and, and we do too, in Jesus' name. Not one of us can, every one of us can do that. You can do what I just did. You can pray with someone. You know, when I think about the ways in which we shine, there are so many diverse ways. You can invite somebody to church. You're like, hey, our preacher, sometimes he's long-winded, sometimes he rants. Today he's a little bit longer. But you should come. God's there. And I maybe, maybe the last story I'll share with you as we close out the sermon today is, is this, that Maybe the way you're supposed to shine, to not be ashamed of the gospel, is the biblical way, and that is to start by being baptized. You realize that baptism is a picture of the death of Jesus Christ, his burial, and his resurrection. And when someone's being baptized, they're proclaiming that the old Robbie, the old you, is, that was dead in their sins and trespasses, has been laid to rest. And that because of God's faith and his love and his son's sacrifice for you, he's raised me to new life. Just as Jesus was placed in a tomb and raised from the dead, so have I been. It's the way you let your light shine before others. Yesterday I was 10 a.m. I was at a barn. There was a guy, his name is Tom Zeller. Tom Zeller, I didn't know him. Two weeks ago, I didn't know him. But one of the guys in this church called me and said, hey, could we do a baptism at a guy's house? What would you think of that? I said, I think we need to get him to church. 
He goes, he's got health situations and he can't get to church. I said, I think we should take the portable baptistry and set it up in his barn and get him baptized then. And he said, really? I said, yeah, when do you want to do it? He says, let's do it in two weeks. So the plan was next Saturday to baptize him. And then there was a hospital visit and then they placed him on hospice and they didn't know if he was going to be here or what kind of state, physical condition he would be here by next Saturday. And so they called and said, can we move it up? I said, let's get it done. So I walk out into that barn yesterday and it wasn't just me and Tom. It was Tom and I and 20 or 30 of his friends, that family that he had called. And Tom's legs are about the size of my forearms. And Tom has oxygen and Tom's in a wheelchair. We had to pick him up and set him into the baptistry. And when he sat down in the water, Tom began to hyperventilate. Tom, because we had a nurse there, his O2 sats, that little thing they put on his finger had dropped below, uh, like low 60s. Tom was hyperventilating. He was really nervous. I can't breathe, he said. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. I'm about to get out of this water. I can't breathe. Calm down, Tom. Calm down. Deep breaths, deep breaths. For a moment, I thought we were going to have to call an ambulance. Finally, Tom says, get me out of here. I got to get out of this water. I can't breathe. I said, Tom, I knew if Tom got out of that baptistry, he'd never get back in. I said, Tom, you want to be baptized, don't you? He said, I do. I said, then some, you get me a bucket of water. We're going to get this done real quick. I look at one. I said, you get his oxygen, pull it off. We'll pour water over him, put the oxygen right back on him. We're going to be done. He said, okay, that works. I said, I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit as I poured that water over him. And applause broke out in that room. And Tom, a smile went across his face. Are you on hospice? Is your health failing? Is there a reason why you haven't ever let your light shine before men? Because I'm telling you, in that room, in that barn, a miracle happened. And that is the miracle of Tom lit a light for all to see in that room. This man loves Jesus so much and he'd never been baptized. And it's that important to him that whatever small amount of time he has left on this earth, he would dare get into water he couldn't get out of if he went under. And he couldn't breathe, but he was like, I've got to do this because God wants me to do this. God has commanded me to do this. Why haven't you been baptized? Do you know there's a baptism service that I went and watched somebody get baptized that I was saved at? And then when I was baptized, somebody else was saved on that day? I'm telling you, if you let your light shine before men, the power of the gospel you'll see God move in amazing ways. Church, if you want to stay on mission, don't be ashamed of the gospel. Let your light shine. Father, we come to you today asking you to allow us to live out our faith before you, before others. God, we don't want to be that candle under a a basket. We don't want to be that city that's not on a hill. You came and died for me. And Lord, I pray today that we would put to death all shame and God, that we would live for you openly and we would live intentionally making disciples. It's in Jesus.